So if you add a magnetic field to the atoms, they do have a magnetic moment. Typically, they have an unpaired electron, these alkalis, so they have a spin, and that spin can interact with the magnetic field, and that's what gave us the magnetic trapping, for example. So you have this Zeeman shift that you have in electronic systems. But you don't have a Lorentz force because you don't have a charge for these atoms. So <coughs> what a lot of people are trying to do is to somehow mimic the effect of Lorentz forces so that you can study a lot of the rich phenomena that you see in, in condensed matter, like fractional quantum hole physics, for example. So historically, the first approach that I'll go through is, has been to simply rotate the gas. Okay. So here is a gas that's trapped in an optical trap, in this case in uh, Wolfgang Catterley's group at MIT. And what they do in this experiment, this is, they've done this both with a Bose-Einstein condensate and with a fermionic superfluid. What they do is they shine these two green beams on it, which are again like little mini traps. And you can think of them like spoons more, like spoons that are rotating the superfluid. So you have a superfluid that's in a trap, which is like a bucket, and you're sticking those spoons and stirring the gas up. And what you see is when you stir this superfluid gas, you see the appearance of quantized vortices. Sorry, you see the appearance of vortex lattices. And this is what you expect, because in a superfluid, you know you can only add the angular momentum uh, in a quantized manner. But you can also think of this, uh, like you can think of it like helium-4, but you can also think of it in a different way. If you have a type 2 superconductor, you add a magnetic field to it, you also get vortices. So here you're seeing the analogy that a rotating, um, uh, a rotating neutral gas looks like a charged gas that is in a magnetic field. Okay, so that's one approach. So but the question... So you're saying that the faster you rotate... There's more vortices. It's large, like a larger magnetic field. Yeah. So now the, the question is, can this be pushed towards a strongly correlated quantum hole regime? Okay, can you get to, to interesting phases with this approach? So here's um, a Hamiltonian you can write down. So in the rotating frame, you can start with a static Hamiltonian and subtract out omega LZ, where omega is the rotation rate and LZ is the angular momentum operator. Okay? So the static Hamiltonian in the lab frame, what you have is just a kinetic energy for the trapped gas, and we put it in a harmonic trap. Okay, so that's this VFR, is just a harmonic trapping potential. And then you subtract out this to go to the rotating frame, and you can do some algebra. And then what you end up with is you can show that this maps to a Hamiltonian that looks like uh, you've added a vector potential here. So this is a consequence of the Coriolis force in the rotating frame. And you've also had a centrifugal term, which subtracts from the trapping potential. So this is the term you're after. You've engineered a vector potential, so you, you have now your magnetic field that's producing the vortices. But you've also kind of reduced the trapping frequency of the gas. Okay, so you, you're no longer trapped, confining the gas as strongly. So the formal mapping is basically a harmonically trapped gas that is rotating can map to um, a charged gas in a magnetic field, but with a reduced confinement, okay? And the limit that the trapping frequency matches the rotation frequency, it becomes just a 2D system which is charged in a magnetic field. So here it is in pictures. So this is uh, the spectrum of, uh, of a gas that's in a 2D harmonic trap, so in, in a harmonic trap and you're rotating it. So initially, here, this is the spectrum at, at zero rotation. So usually you're used to probably labeling these with NX and Y, the occupation numbers in the two directions. Uh, but here I'm labeling them with the angular momentum projection along Z. And as you rotate faster and faster, you can see if you subtract out the omega LZ, those states along the diagonal start to move down, okay? And the other ones move up. And so all these states come together when omega, the, this uh, rotation frequency matches the trapping frequency, and they form um, basically a set of degenerate levels, which looks a lot like a Landau level. Okay? So this is now, if you put bosons in this Landau level, what you'll get is you expect a fractional quantum hole effect for the bosons due to the interactions uh, breaking the degeneracy of this Landau level. So 
the challenge here is that as this limit is approached, the gas is barely trapped. Okay? So it gets more and more dilute. So here's the experiment that was done in Eric Cornell's group in 2004. Um, they take the gas, this is looking at the gas from the side, and you're rotating it. And you see that as it rotates faster and faster, it expands this way, and that's because the confinement is reduced. And eventually it reaches a 2D limit, as here they have a rotation frequency that is 0.993 of the trapping frequency. So with this, they've entered the lowest Landau level with this Bose-Einstein condensate. That's when the chemical potential is less than the vibrational splitting. Okay? So they've entered the lowest Landau level. And they do see the appearance of lots of vortices in this vortex lattice. But the relevant number for strongly correlated states is the ratio of the number of particles to the number of vortices. If those numbers are comparable, then you're starting to enter a strongly correlated state. In their case, unfortunately, they only have about a ratio of 500. So for, for every vortex, there's about 500 particles. So this is very much in a mean field quantum hole regime. And the limitation basically is this confinement issue. As you rotate faster, the gas is less confined, becomes more dilute, the interactions become weaker, so the temperatures for reaching these strongly correlated states become lower and lower. Okay, so they were stuck there for, yeah. It's like, it does look like a magnetic field that you're applying to a charged uh, system. Yeah. So, so now, uh, the people are stuck with this for a, for a while, until in the last few years, there's a new, a new idea that came along, which is laser dressing, that I'll attempt to explain to you here using a very simplified picture. Okay, so here, what I'm going to consider is a two-level system that we're shining a laser beam on. Okay, so... The, the weird thing I'm going to assume here, yeah. One question about the previous approach. So the, eight, the, the gauge field A is actually proportional to omega. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, that was given by this omega cross B. Yeah. Okay, so, so I'm going to make um, an assumption here that this is a metastable excited state, okay? And this is the stable ground state. And those are split by an optical frequency. So you, you'll see why that's relevant later on. So this is like an EV transition here. And uh, typically, like, if you use an alkali atom, the excited state would decay very quickly to the ground state. But we'll assume this is a metastable state just for simplicity for now. Now, we shine a laser beam. And this laser beam has a matrix element connecting the ground state to the excited state. This matrix element is omega. And we're detuning the laser beam from the resonance by big delta. Okay. So when you shine a laser beam on the atoms, when they go from the ground state to the excited state, the, the photon that is absorbed by the atom transfers a momentum. This momentum I'll call k sub l. Okay. That's the light momentum. So now we can ask, what, is the, what are the energy states of the atom in the presence of the light beam that is uh, dressing them in this way? So here's the dispersion of the ground state. It's this parabola here in pink. And if I want to draw the dispersion of the excited state, I have to shift it by k sub l because of the absorption of um, this photon momentum. Okay? So that's the blue curve here. And this is, I've drawn them here for the situation where the detuning is zero of the laser beam. Okay, so basically, the light is on resonance. So if I go to what in atomic physics we call a rest state picture, the ground state becomes degenerate with the excited state due to the presence of the photon. Okay, so that's why these two parabolas are at the same, they have the minimum at the same energy. And I'm imagining a very weak beam in this picture, so omega is essentially zero and there's no crossing, uh, there's just no avoided crossing between, the, between those two. And the atoms sit in this state here. Now what I'll do next is I'll introduce a, a positive detuning. Okay, so if with a positive detuning the energy of the ground state goes up in the dress state picture above the excited state. All right. So what that means is this pink curve is now higher than the, the blue curve. So I lower the blue curve and that's the effect of the detuning. And now I'll, I'll start to 
crank up my laser beam, so omega will increase, and this opens up a gap. Here. All right. So these are now the dressed, um, and these are the dressed energies for the for the particle in the presence of the light. And as I crank up the 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 light more and more, we eventually end up with a situation like this. Okay. So what you see is that the particle has moved from having a canonical momentum of zero to something that's at a finite momentum. Okay? The group velocity of the gas is still zero, sitting at this minimum of this parabola. But basically what I've done is I've taken P to P minus QA. So it introduces a vector potential to the atoms. Okay? This is, of course, not a gauge invariant quantity. If you go to a different frame, this A will go away. So now, if you want to produce something gauge invariant, like a magnetic field, you have to have a spatially varying A. So that if you have a curl of A, then you have a magnetic field. Okay, so how can you do that? Well, one way is to have a different detuning. So if you imagine like putting this minimum at a different place as you open up the, the, uh, the Rabi, as you increase the Rabi frequency, then this will shift, all right? So basically, you can, by varying the detuning, vary the vector potential in space. If you can vary the detuning in space. Okay. So let's ask, what is the maximum magnetic field that you can produce this way? Uh, this we'll measure using the number density of flux quanta. So the number of flux quanta is simply the flux uh, that you have divided by the flux quantum h over q. So the number density would be qb over h and B is the curl of A, all right? So this is the expression for the number density of flux quanta, and, I've, and now you can ask what is the maximum value of the vector potential that you have, this QA that we've introduced? Well, the maximum value, it's clear, it's, it's one. You can't shift this minimum more than one, um, which is one unit of KL, all right? So you can, this QA, the maximum it can have is h bar KL, which is the momentum of the photon, which can be written as 1 over the wavelength of light. The maximum density of flux quanta, then, can be deduced by putting the maximum value for the change of this detuning over the length scale here. This, what is the maximum value of this curl? That's 1 over the length scale of the cloud. Right? So the maximum density of flux quanta you can produce is 1 over the length of the cloud times the wavelength of light. How does that compare to the particle density? Because that's the relevant thing. You want to make the number of the, the density of flux quanta comparable to the number density of the atoms. Well, the number density of the atoms I've already told you, their spacing is on the order of the wavelength of light. So that's one over lambda squared. So it's still not quite comparable because typically the length of the cloud is on the order of 100 wavelengths or so. Okay. Um, so a clever scheme, but doesn't quite reach this uh, fractional quantum hole regime. But people have already implemented this part. There's another scheme that has been proposed in this PRL that hasn't been experimentally implemented so far. That one does reach, uh, that one would reach the 1 over lambda squared. Okay. So I'll just go through the experimental realization, which was done in Ian Spielman's group at NIST Maryland. So, um, they're using rubidium, and rubidium, like I said, does not have an excited state which is metastable. It would decay back to the ground state in a few nanoseconds. So instead, they have to use two ground states which are uh, metastable. Those are hyperfine ground states. And those are split by microwave frequencies. So if you were to attempt to do a dressing with a microwave frequency, you run into a problem. The microwave has a wavelength on the order of a centimeter. So the momentum transferred is very low because the relevant length scales here for the particles are these interparticle spacing of microns. So instead, you have to figure out a way to use an optical transition, like I told you earlier. And the solution is to use two optical beams that can connect the two ground states. So you shine two laser beams on the atoms to execute a two-photon transition by basically having one of the frequencies of the light beams be detuned relative to the other by the splitting of the energies between those two ground states. Here it's a bit more complicated for rubidium. There are actually three ground states, but that's a technical detail. Okay, but basically by absorbing light from one of the laser beams and emitting into the other, you can transfer a momentum on, of the photons here, two, two photon momenta, 
And at the same time, you connect two ground states and do the stressing scheme. And in this experiment, they had a variation of the detuning of the laser simply by applying a linear magnetic field gradient across the cloud, which leads to a variation in the Zeeman shift. So uh, the detuning is varied, which means that the vector potential is varying, and therefore you have a magnetic field. And this has some very real consequences, the appearance of vortices in the cloud. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that brings me to the conclusion of this laser dressing. Do you have any questions about it? All right, so now I'm going to switch to a completely different approach that people have done in some experiments, which already takes us to the regime where um, there is a very high flux density on the order of the interparticle spacing, very high magnetic field. So this in a, in a solid, I think, would be like tens of thousands of Teslas or so. Um, so the idea there is we're going to go to fundamentals. We'll, we'll try to use Berry phases. Okay, so I'm sure Charlie already covered some of this material earlier today, but I'll go through quickly through it. So uh, what we're considering here is a quantum system, which um, we will take in a closed loop in a parameter space adiabatically. And what ends up happening is that the wave function is the same at the end of this evolution, except for acquiring some phases, which can be a kinematic phase, which we're not very interested in, in addition to a geometric phase. Okay? The simplest system you see typically in undergraduate textbooks is the spin one half particle in a magnetic field. So if you change the direction of the field adiabatically, the spin follows, and by the time you come back to where you started, it has executed a loop on this block sphere, and it picks up a phase that's related to half the solid angle that you map out. So the Berry phase is given by this formula, which is the integral over a Berry con connection, given by this expression. Okay. And the reason why this is interesting for us is that it's linked to the Arnov-Bohm effect. Okay. So there what you have is, in the Ar Arnov-Bohm experiment, the typical setup you consider is you have a solenoid which, has, uh, which is infinite and it carries uh, some flux inside it, but the magnetic field on the outside is zero but you do have a vector potential. And if you send some electron beam around the solenoid, split it apart, so it travels on, in front of the solenoid and through, uh, behind it, and then interfere those two paths, what you see is that there is a fringe that would shift as you change the magnetic field inside the solenoid. So although the electrons are traveling in the region of space where there is no magnetic field, they're still affected by the vector potential. You can also think of this using Berry phases. So you can consider a flux line where you take some charged particles around this flux line and so you execute a closed loop in real space and at the end you pick up a Berry phase. Okay, so that's another way of looking at this Arnold uh, bohm experiment. Okay, so why is this interesting? This is interesting because we can now try to, since we don't have these magnetic fields, instead of trying to, one way of introducing this magnetic field is to try to imprint the Berry phase on the wave function of the atoms, and therefore, they act as if they are in a magnetic field. Okay, so we'll basically give these wave, we'll introduce this Berry phase by hand. So those are Berry phases in real space I've been describing, but you can also have them in momentum space by going to, uh, by considering particles moving in a lattice. So there you have a periodic potential. And you know the eigenstates are block waves, which are periodic in quasi-momentum. So if you start with a particle at some point um, in your Brion zone and go adiabatically through it, then you end up at the same quasi-momentum. And so again, this is an application of, if you're, you have an adiabatic system, you go back to where you started, so you can pick up a Berry phase, and in certain topological band structures, th that would happen. And there, in a one-dimensional system, the, it goes by the name of a Zach phase. I'm starting with 1D because I'll show you an experiment on 1D in a second. So the, the Zach phase is now given by the integral of the Berry connection over the parameter space, which in this case is the momentum. Okay. So here's a simple model that was realized in cold atom experiments. It's called the sue schrieffer heger model. I don't know if you saw it earlier today. Um, so in, in, this, in this model, what you have is, um, 
It's a model of polyacetylene where you have a chain of carbon atom 